Namaste. So if you've been following along with our series on the Katopanishad, which I hope you are, we talk a lot about death. And in the Upanishad, death is portrayed as a person, a personality, a very powerful personality, a very noble personality. So what is death, really? Who is death? Well, I've been doing some research in the Upanishads, especially in the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad. And there are so many secrets, so many surprises, so many amazing revelations. I think that's the Upanishad that we're going to do next after Kata. So death is described, well, he's mentioned in Kata Upanishad as Virat. And Virat, also known as Vaishvanara, also known as Hiranyagarbha, is the sum total of all living beings in the universe. And he is born directly as a mental son of Brahma in the beginning of creation. And he goes on to create the first living beings. And actually, all of us are his descendants. He created a son, but he was hungry. Death is also known as hunger, by the way. Death is hungry. He is born that way. And the reason he's born that way is that this exalted birth that he has as a mental son of Brahma in the beginning of the universe is the result of successful completion of the Ashvamedha Jagna. Ashvamedha or horse sacrifice is one of the most powerful uh, sacrifices in the Vedas. It's given in the Sama Veda. So this sacrifice gives one the, the benediction of successfully performing it is that one becomes Hiranyagarbha in the next life. One becomes actually death in the next life. And one becomes the ancestor of all living entities. Now, as I said, death is also known as hunger. And hunger means that he has the uh, privilege or the function or whatever it is of killing all the living entities because they are regarded as his. They're all his descendants. And especially the ones that do not take up the process of self-realization are viewed as pashu, animals, livestock, not human beings. They're not human beings because they are not engaged in the purpose of human life, which is self-realization, realization of Brahman. So, as you can see, this is a very, very serious, very important matter. Why are we suffering? Why are we, in this human life, torn between desire, love, and death? And the answer is, because it's our karma. Because in the previous life, we did not take steps to remove the suffering from the next life. And so we find ourselves here on planet Earth in the midst of all kinds of confusion and lies and bad behavior by all kinds of bad actors. Suffering. And we're trying to gain the happiness of love, but it's not working out. Uh, there's an old jazz song. <laughs> you don't know what love is until you know the meaning of the blues. Until you have a love you have to lose. Baby, you don't know what love is. I know so many old jazz songs <laughs> because I used to be a professional musician. But anyway, 
What does it mean? You don't know what love is until you have to suffer the loss of a beloved. And for me, this happened very early in life. For many people, it happens during puberty. Their first love affair fails, as it almost always does. And so they get to know the meaning of the blues. And it's suffering, emotional suffering, mental suffering. Why? Based on desire. Out of desire, people form relationships. They try to satisfy these desires, but they always, always end in loss and suffering. I mean, at the very outside, one or the other or both partners die. And in any case, the whole thing is temporary. So the problem is our view, our perspective on life is limited to this one life, this body. It's because we think of ourselves that we are the body. And so all the desires based on this body are real and are something that we have to work to satisfy. But all the revealed scriptures of all the religions in the world that I'm aware of, including the Buddha's teaching, stress very strongly that there is a next life, there is a next world, and we're going to have to live that life in that world. And we can perform ceremonies and other religious acts like meditation and so on, learning the scriptures and all, that reduce or eliminate the suffering in the next life. Full self-realization means no suffering, even in this life. Because why? It removes desire. We get to see that desire is the cause of suffering. And so we drop it. And then that leads automatically to self-realization. Even my Adi Guru, Srila Prabhupada, said one time that practice of celibacy leads automatically to Brahman realization. That's good enough for me. How about you? <laughs> so in other words, self-realization protects us from suffering, not just in this life, but in the next life. Study of the Vedas, performance of puja and different kinds of sacrifices, meditation, all of these lead to the ultimate goal of complete self-realization. And that should be our target. Yes, if we perform um, very esoteric, difficult Vedic ceremonies like the Ashwamedha Jagna, we can attain very high, very powerful states of being in the next life. We can become Vaishvanara, means all-pervading. Huh? Virat, the sum total of all the beings in the universe. And we can be masters of the Pashu, the cattle, huh? those living beings and even human beings that, out of ignorance, don't follow the path of self-realization. So, those are simply food for the demigods and ultimately for death, because death is virat. Death is the Hiranyagarbha. It is that which takes us away from the illusion of this life. And the illusion is based on ignorance. It's because we don't study the Vedas, we don't study the Upanishads, we don't meditate, we don't do these various processes of sadhana like japam and so on that result in insight and revelation. We don't do them because we don't realize that not doing them causes suffering, not only in this life, but also in the next. Now, it's interesting, in Shankaracharya's commentary on Brihadaranaka Upanishad, he mentions that the people who believe in the next life are the ones who study the Vedas, 
the ones who perform sacrifice, the ones who do sadhana. Why? Because they want to reduce or eliminate the suffering in the next life. And of course, they also get the byproducts of reducing or eliminating suffering in this life. So in all ways, from all angles of vision, these are good things. But unfortunately, the present society teaches ignorance. It teaches this materialistic point of view that there is no next life. The body is the self. Creation is by accident. Huh? <laughs> Ridiculous idea. <laughs> and that, that life goes on, and then at the end, it's over. There is nothing after death. So this is total ignorance. And this is one of the three causes of death. They're given in Kata Upanishad as ignorance, lust, and action. In other words, out of ignorance, we lust after the things in the material world and perform actions to try to enjoy them. And because of that, we create karma, which results in suffering, both in this life and the next. But this is a pathetic situation. And when we look at the world, we see, I don't know, maybe 99% of human beings are in this kind of mindset. But, you know, this philosophy is very ancient. It's called Mimangsavada. Mimangsavada means this whole mindset that only material things are real, the body is the self, uh, what happens in life is basically by chance, and that you can enjoy anything and there's no consequences, no karma, no next life, nothing like that. This is Mimangsavada. And in Shankaracharya's commentaries, oh, there are such wonderful arguments against it. And we're going to be going into them in detail in the next series, which I think will be on Brihadar and Yakopanishad. So we should understand that becoming entangled in loving affairs in this world is ignorance and it causes suffering. Now, I know this is not a very popular point of view, but I'm sorry. It happens to be the truth. This is why I took sannyas. This is why when I look back on my life and, you know, as an intelligent person, as a sensitive, creative person, I was not able to find a suitable mate, right? And later on, some people, or some uh, ill-motivated, uh, angry, uh, lustful people uh, created a lot of problems for me with black propaganda all over the Internet and ruined my reputation and so on and so forth. All these things conspired to actually make me a very isolated and now, looking back at that, I'm thankful. I think it's a benediction. It's a blessing. Because I did not become attached. I did not become entangled with relationships with people who are going to die. And I'm going to die. So, at the end of life, which is something coming up for me now, the last part of life. I mean, I'm 76 years old. I don't have, you know, a lot of confidence in living a long time from now. That all these things come up, one looks back on one's life and contemplates the situations and the choices that resulted in the life as lived, as experienced. And one wonders and contemplates how it could have been different or what would have happened if it was different. And I've come to the conclusion that it was perfect. <laughs> it was perfect because unseen forces prevented me from becoming entangled in the kind of relationships that cause deep deep suffering and regret, especially towards the end of life. I'm free. I'm a sannyasi. 
I have no entanglements, no connections, deep, you know, emotional connections with anybody, and I don't want any. Thank you very much. So this is a blessing on me. And so this path is there. It's given in the Vedas. It's recommended for everyone who's intelligent to attain renunciation and dispassion, to disconnect from all these passionate relationships, emotional relationships, attachments, and identifications in material life, and identify with the self alone, which is the object of self-realization. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>